Kid, right here. This is what he looked like as a baby. He was born and raised in Iowa. So you can see him with his brother here. He would build these planes with his brother. Wow. And he was in the marching band. He played the oboe. You can see that there. And this, he was on the swim team. So uh -huh. he would do theater as well. So he was just an ordinary kid. But he grew up to be an extraordinary man with numerous awards, and numerous patents, numerous inventions. And most famously, he is known for this, which is the invention of the integrated circuit. And the integrated circuit is found on almost any electronic device in the world. You can find an integrated circuit. And that was Robert Lewis's co-invention. Mm -hmm. So he was also an optimist. He believed in the power of positive thinking. And he really believed in the power of human potential. Science. Go off and do something more. So he, he had this belief that the next great idea could come from anyone, no matter who they were. And this helps drive Intel to become what it was focusing on the people. And then over here, he has a very famous quote, which is, don't be encumbered by history, go off and do something wonderful. Wow. The picture is Jean Jones, and Jean Jones was the Intel Museum founder. So it's because of her that we're standing here today. And um, you can see up there, you can see the Intel logo. That is the first logo we had back in 1969. That is the Intel dropped E logo. And nowadays we have this symbol here. This is the Intel all around symbol. So that circle symbolizes that Intel is all around. This was adopted in 2006. We also had the Intel the design like the processor. You can see that one there. So finally we have a screen. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have color screens. So you had a choice between either green or amber. And both of those screens had black text. Mm -hmm. So that's all you had. And we didn't have hard drives back then. Hard drives were not invented yet. So you had to store everything on these disks that were about this big. Going to 14 nanometers. So much smaller than that. About 270 pounds. Um, this is very small compared to the ones that are actually used. The ones that are actually used are about four times taller than this. So you can just imagine it would go from the floor all the way up to the ceiling. And the way that these are made, you can see right here. So you have a metal rod like this, and from that you hang a little bit of silicon. It's called a silicon seed crystal. And then you dunk that seed crystal into molten silicon. And then you spin it around. And while it's spinning, it is collecting layer upon layer of silicon until it gets to the width that we want. Mm -hmm. So this is a 2-inch ingot, and that is a 12-inch mm -hmm. ingot. And what we do is they slice them up yeah. to one millimeter thick wafers like this. And this is what we use to make microprocessors. Mm -hmm. So we buy these from a company. We don't make the silicon. And we use these to go through this entire process of oh, making yeah. the microprocessor. It starts from right to left. There are about 300 steps to making a microprocessor, one of the most complicated products in the world to make. So we can't have all the steps in our museum. We need another museum for it to have all the steps. So we have some of the main the main steps. We have ion implantation. This is where we dope it. We dope the paper so that some parts are ionized, some parts are pure. Then protect it with IK dielectric material. This helps keep the transistors small. Otherwise, these four have been used before in a microprocessor. So the main ingredients is what? What is this area named after? Yes, silicon. So silicon is the main ingredient in a microprocessor. And silicon is made out of sand, yeah. like you're saying. So you take with the beach, pick up sand, you're holding impure sand. You clean it. Right, so you have to, you have to purify it, you yeah. have to deoxify it. Um, you purify it to one billionth percent impurity, so 99.9999999 percent impurity. It's one of the most pure things on the planet. And um, it's abundant. It is the second most abundant element on the planet, next to oxygen being the first. Yeah. So, silicon is very special. This is all about conductivity. Whether something is a conductor or an insulator, whether electricity passes through or electricity stops. So, silicon, in its natural state, is an insulator. And that's because it's made out of sand. And if lightning strikes sand, nothing happens. Um, so we can change silicon, we can change what it does through a process called 
doping. And doping is where we blast it with chemicals and that changes the composition. And it turns it into ionized silicon. And what do you think this is? It is a conductor. So ionized silicon is a conductor. Nice. And we would cut out every single line of circuitry that you see here. So this would take a very long time to do. This was called the ruby lift method. They, they cut it on a material called ruby lift, which is like paper. And these are the five mask layers of Intel's first microprocessor, the 4004, released in 1971. But today, we have about 40 layers of circuitry. So much higher number. Um, we can't really do this process anymore. This will take it forever to do. We can't do it by hand. So instead, we use computers to help us. We use a program called CAD, um, C-A-D, that stands for Computer Aided Design. And that helps us design all the complex layers that we have. But this is pretty. It's got all the nice colors that you can see. In the 70s, you can see some of these ads here. Technology, you can see some of the 80s as well. Technology in the 80s. You can even check this out all you want. We have plenty of things. We have just one more stop, and then we're all done. And then I'll let you Thank guys you. Go. Yeah. Some of our previous products. So you can see some of our processors here, like this one. This was the 286 microprocessor, released in 1982. It had 134,000 transistors, so it's mm -hmm. getting up there into numbers. It had um, backwards compatibility, so your old software would still work on your new computer. That's something that I still have today. 1985, we released the successor to the 286. Mm -hmm. We had the 386 microprocessor, had 275,000 yeah. transistors. This was used all the way up until 2007 in cell phones, yeah. uh -huh. before the smartphone thing happened, before yeah. smartphones happened. And it had multiple software program functionality, so you could have two software programs mm -hmm. or more open at the same time. And 1989, after the 286 and the 386, we have the 486, which had over 1 million transistors. It had the power of a mainframe computer in just one chip, and it also had um, a built-in math coprocessor, which made it dramatically faster. And it was so good and so powerful that other companies were actually putting the name 486 on their products but they weren't using our 486. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. So that was a problem, because that was kind of copyright infringement. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't have the number copyrighted, though. So some legal battles ensued, and the court ruled that you cannot copyright a number. Yep. No one can own a number. You can't own the number one or the number two, so you can't own the number 486. So we needed a name. We needed a name to have our own that we could copyright and make our own. So we hired a marketing company back in 1991, and they came up with the Pentium. I wonder if it ever is going to stop. And currently, the answer is no. We keep going. We keep finding the technology to make things smaller and smaller and smaller. But we might hit a milestone, because we're eventually going to get to atomic levels, and how small can you get after that? So we're working on combining silicon with laser light technology. So they'll have lasers and nanoseconds. 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 And a nanosecond is one billionth of a second. So to show you how fast that is, we have this game here. This is called Fastest Hands. You wave your hand over these two sensors, and it tells you your speed in nanoseconds. So that took me 154 million nanoseconds to do. So if you want to see how fast you are, you go 205 million, so a bit higher. You want to get as low as possible. You want to try and make it fast so it gets slower. So I'll give it a shot. You gotta make sure that you hit both sensors. Oh, up. Whoa. Good. Whoa, that's nice. <laughs> 78. 78 million. You gotta hit both sensors. Go again. There you go. 130. Oh, so great. if you take this number yeah. and then multiply that by a few billion, yeah. that's how many processes we've done in just that amount of time. And these these sensors are one foot across which is how far light can travel in just one nanosecond. So one nanosecond, light goes that far. It's pretty remarkable.
here's about how small processors are. Well, so we can actually zoom into a chip to see just how small the components are. So right now, this width is the width of a pencil eraser, which is about the width of my pinky. So that can hold this much stuff already. So now we're going to zoom in and see just how small can get. So now we're at the width of one grain of sand. What I have to do is just match this code to this code here. And it's, you can spell anything. <laughs> That's uh, switch it. Two to five million dollars to make. And, uh, this is the most important floor right here. This is the clean room. Yeah. Oh. And it's called the clean room because it needs to be clean. Um, if dust or dirt oh, yeah. were to fall on a microprocessor, that would completely ruin it because the dust is bigger than the transistors. Yeah, yeah. So it would smash them. And what does the procedure for clean? Exactly. So that's exactly what I was about to talk about. So you have the fan kind of like that, that pushes the air down through the holes in the floor. You can see we have the same kind of tiles. And then we clean the air in this area here, and then we pump it back in, we recirculate it uh, once every six seconds. So 10 times a minute, we clean all of the air. It's known as a class one facility, which means that if you were to screw up a box of air from a fat and count all of the dust particles inside of it, Bunny suit men. Yeah. These became very popular after a Super Bowl commercial. Um, there's a Super Bowl commercial of them dancing to.